If there is one movie in tokusatsu cinema that often gets both neglected and overlooked for all the wrong reasons, it's definitely the film Warning from Space. This movie is sadly shunned by kaiju fans, but I can understand where the neglection is coming from. When I was introduced to this movie, it was on a compilation set simply titled Giant Monsters, which featured a ton of kaiju movies, mostly gamer titles, and one convenient set, all in glorious bootleg quality. Hey, I was a kid when I saw this, so I didn't think anything of it. But what I did think of was how greatly disappointed I was in this one movie on the set. Because it wasn't a giant monster movie. I didn't understand why this was even featured on the set. But the reality of that is, is that this movie never set itself out to be a kaiju film. It was the poor advertisement that connects itself to the movie that sends the wrong message to audiences on what this movie wasn't trying to be. And due to that, people just remember this as the movie with the stupid starfish costumes. Well in this video I hope to give the movie the proper respect I feel it deserves. So with that being said, let's dive in. Please consider both liking and subscribing, it really helps. Tell this to everybody wherever they are. Watch the skies. The 1950s was truly the golden era of science fiction blockbusters. The Atomic Age brought with it many radioactive creatures that came from dinosaurs, insects, and of course man himself. But it wasn't just atomic giants that engulfed cinemas. Aliens also gained a ton of attention throughout the decade. Sure, they've been around in movies before, but really gained popularity in the 50s thanks to films like Earth vs. the Flying Saucers and War of the Worlds. On the other side of the globe, Toa would go on to become one of the biggest Japanese film studios and was awakening their own atomic giants around this time, beginning with Gojira in 1954 and its sequel soon after. However, they weren't the first Japanese studio to come up with an alien picture. It would be their rival studio Daie who would beat them to the punch on that, with their film titled Uchujin Tokyo ni Aruwaru, translated as Space Men appear in Tokyo, released in January in 1956. Studio Daie is well known today for their yokai monster films, the Daimajin trilogy, and of course the Gamma series. Space Men appear in Tokyo not only had the honor of being the first Japanese alien picture, but would also go on to be the first Japanese science fiction film to be in color, again even beating Toho on that. The movie was even written by Hideo Oguni, who has done screenplays for a number of Akira Kurosawa films like Seven Samurai. The movie is also apparently based on a novel written by Gintaro Nakajima, but there's no sources pointing out to exactly what novel it's supposed to be. In an article put out by SciFist in 2017, Nakajima apparently had never written a novel, and that the whole novel thing just stuck around without anyone really going in depth on it. Nakajima, however, did base the story on an old Japanese folktale called Kaguya Hime. There's no star-shaped aliens in this, but there are some subtle similarities to both stories. Anyway, how is the movie in general? Well, let's go over with a quick synopsis and find out. The Earth's in danger when a planetoid called Planet R is on course to impact with Earth. A group of aliens known as the Pyrans try to warn the Earthlings, specifically Japan, about the incoming threat, but can't get the information out to them because the people of Earth are afraid of them, and run away when they're spotted. So the Pyrans take the initiative to transform into the inhabitants of Earth so they can finally warn them about Planet R. As you can tell from the plot, the aliens aren't your typical planet conquerors. No, in a bit of a twist, they're actually here to try and save humanity. Now that concept isn't entirely original with this film, as it has been done already before with the Robert Weiss film The Day the Earth Stood Still, and without a doubt that film was a big influence on spacemen appear in Tokyo. They both feature extraterrestrial beings in the form of Earthlings, coming from space to warn the planet's inhabitants about a future threat. There are some more similarities to both features, but I'll touch on them as we go along. You might have noticed in the synopsis that I didn't bring up any characters. I mean, there are people we follow, but none of them really come off as someone who feels mandatory to the plot. Say for maybe Dr. Matsuda because he comes up with a formula for an atomic weapon that could destroy Planet R. The actor Keizo Kawasaki is given top billing, but he almost does nothing in the movie. Dr. Kimura is the character we're introduced to in the opening of the film, but again, he almost gets nothing to do either. When the pirates go to Earth disguised as humans, the main one known as Ginkgo tries to blend in with human society so that she can get close to the Earthlings and warn them about the threat. She also takes the appearance of a famous performer known as Hikari Ozura, but aside from one little joke, 
It really doesn't mean anything. Now I want to go back to the day the Earth stood still for this one. Like Ginkgo, the character Klaatu is an alien that is sent to Earth as an arbiter. Klaatu makes it abundantly clear that he wants to speak to all the world's nations under one roof about some kind of danger. But he's declined since the world really isn't getting along with each other all that well. You have to keep in mind World War II had just ended not too long ago. Klaatu doesn't hold his thoughts back. Calling the whole hatred the nations have towards each other as just petty squabbles. So Klaatu tries to find a way to send his message out to the world. But while doing so, he encounters a mother and her child whom he forms a bond with. And it's thanks to them that he's able to explore more about the Earth. He witnesses the dark side of humanity, but also sees the good in it too. But he never lets down his guard on what he came here to do. He may be forming relationships, but he still keeps his mission in mind. Ginkgo doesn't really have the same appeal Klaatu does. Not even close. When she comes to Earth, she's in a lake that the characters just so happen to be at. After they find her, they try to learn more about her. And then she plays tennis. She does let some of her abilities slip out, like going through walls or jumping 10 feet in the air. The scientist characters play detective for a bit and come up with the conclusion she's an alien. And they find out roughly 10 minutes in the film after they find her in the lake. I get the movie wants to get a move on with things, but this is way too fast. And the story doesn't take advantage of the whole fish out of water concept here, because of how quickly Ginkgo's identity gets revealed. She doesn't form a relationship with anyone, takes no interest in exploring the modern world, and on top of that, she's a very boring character. Klaatu is more interesting because the film takes the time to build a character out of him, whereas Ginkgo gets almost no time. Hell, after they discover her, she and the pirates pretty much exit the movie, say for the climax. There's also a very indecisive moment with her. When she spots Dr. Matsuda's formula for Element 101, she freaks out when seeing this, saying man shouldn't deal with this type of power, and destroys his notes. Only to come in later and say, hey did Dr. Matsuda get that formula done? We kinda need it to stop Planet R. While on this moment, Dr. Matsuda had been kidnapped near the end of the film, and is tied up in a crumbling building at an unknown location for a couple days. The dub for some reason ridiculously expands that to over a month, as if someone could really survive that long without food or water, not to mention also having to deal with the extreme heat. Hell, even a couple days is stretching that out, but it doesn't really bother me. The Pyrans managed to find him because of a ring he wore that Ginkgo might have given him at one point that is able to track his location. I say that with a balance of uncertainty because there's never any moment in the film that shows when he got this ring, creating this very contrived moment that may confuse audiences into thinking they missed something. And while still on this moment, Matsuda was kidnapped by a guy named George. George is the closest the movie gets to a villain, and like our main leads, there's not really much to him. He tries to buy the formula for Matsuda so he can sell it to an unspecified country. In fact, George even says he's not Japanese, even though he's obviously being played by a Japanese actor, but he's wearing sunglasses indoors, so I'd say that's foreign enough. The movie does try to hammer in the whole nuclear warfare spiel, but unlike in Godzilla where that's the metaphorical theme of that story, here in Spaceman Appear in Tokyo, it just kind of comes off as clunky exposition, being told to characters because their country experienced atomic weaponry firsthand. That's the whole reason on why the Pyrons go to Japan, to warn them so that they can warn the rest of the world into using their atomic weapons to destroy Planet R. But when you really think about it, it makes little sense on why go to Japan when they can go to the other places that actually have these weapons. And they send a bunch of pirates down here too. And aside from Ginkgo, the rest of them don't do anything. Spread them across the planet, don't throw them all in one place to achieve nothing. For being intelligent aliens, they sure don't strategize all that well. But now let's look at the pirates, And let's get this out of the way real fast. The pirate suits are awful. Probably some of the worst suits in cinema history. There's no articulation in these, half the time we see them they're just an emotionless state, and they do this weird thing with their hands that never goes explained. And I wouldn't doubt if the suits are one of the reasons why this movie gets a bad rap. Hell, the American cut of the film goes out of its way to explicitly state that the pirates are wearing starfish costumes, pointing out that that's not their real appearances. So capable of assuming human appearance, Pirates in their natural form must wear that strange protective clothing which gave rise to the reports of monsters. Putting the bad suits aside though, the design of the aliens are 
actually really good. The look of the Pyrans were created by artist Taro Okamoto. Okamoto was an avant-garde artist with a lot of experimental pieces, often integrating things like anti-war propaganda or the economic class of Japan into his work. Pretty much he lets his art speak for what he has to say about the world. The Pyran designs are very simplistic. They're simply star-like in appearance, with a single eye in the center of their bodies that glows when they speak. The design definitely stems itself from the Eye of Providence. The Eye of Providence is a symbol that depicts an eye, often enclosed in a triangle and surrounded by rays of light or glory, meant to represent divine providence, whereby the Eye of God watches over humanity. Even the role the Pyrans play matches that as well. And I wonder if DC Comics took inspiration from these aliens for their own extraterrestrial villain, Starro, who coincidentally also has a kaiju-sized version of the character. To segue from that, I want to address the muddled state this movie often finds itself in. If you stare at these pictures here, you might get the idea that this is a kaiju movie. It is not. There was no point to which this film was ever going to be a kaiju picture. There's a rumor that states the first Godzilla movie was the inspiration for this film. There's never been anything on record to state that case. Not saying that couldn't have been an influence, but do you really believe this was going to compete with this? The Pyrans were designed early on to be human-sized so that they can be relatable when trying to help mankind. The marketing sure didn't help in that aspect often depicting the Pyrans as these giant starfish creatures ready to attack Japan. If Godzilla influenced anything on the film, it was definitely the advertisement. Another thing the posters often show is the Pyrans being red. Even on the Japanese home release in 2019 depicted them as being red, when in the actual film they're anything but red. Again, I wonder if this was simply an advertisement choice just to accentuate their appearances better on the poster. Speaking of coloring, how does it fare up here? This is something we don't necessarily think of nowadays because films are all obviously going to be in color, but back in the 50s, and especially in Japan, color motion pictures were very uncommon. And of course, with this being the first Japanese sci-fi flick to be in color, it has a bit more to offer than your average movie. Tato Okamoto also was in charge of the coloring of the picture, and Studio Daie really couldn't have picked a better choice to work in this department. The peaceful moments are vibrant and lush. The colors help give these scenes a very laid-back and welcoming feeling. The opposite happens towards the countdown for Planet R. The colors are now all dim and drab, and really set that apocalyptic vibe as if the planet itself is losing its color and dying. The reddish lighting also helps add to how scorching hot the weather has gotten, as Planet R draws near. The colors also get muted whenever the exposition scenes are in play, most likely as to not be distracting whenever important information is being spelled out. Okamoto doesn't use the colors as a gimmick, but instead uses them to supplement the scenes. As an artist, he knows exactly how to make these moments shine at their best. The effects work is done pretty good as well, you know, minus the bad pirate suits. The effects work was done by Taro Mataba, who was assisted by Yon Soburu Tsukichi and Shinsuke Kojima. The miniature work is well done here, if a bit unpolished compared to something Tsuburaya would have worked on. Speaking of Tsuburaya, he must have thought highly of Motaba, as he brought him on to work on some early Ultra Series projects. And Tsukichi would go on to be an effects director for the first Gamera movie. Speaking of which, there's a cameo here by Noriaki Yuasa, the man who would go on to direct almost the entire Showa era Gamera series. While on topic of director, Koji Shima held the director's title for this picture. Going through his filmography, you're most likely only going to know him for this movie. And that's a shame because he's not a bad director. A lot of shots in the film are choreographed nicely and have a bit of a style to them. The film's budget wasn't big, so to tolerate with the minimal effects, Shima amps up the drama to aid in what would have been a pretty dull sci-fi flick. And while the characters aren't memorable, they're just likable enough to want to make you see exactly how they're going to get by the devastation that awaits them. I also got to go over how impressive the evacuation montages are. Unlike the Godzilla films which show people running in an orderly fashion, Space Men Appear in Tokyo actually ups the Godzilla films by making these moments feel chaotic. Not saying Godzilla films don't have crazy evacuation scenes, they're just few and far between. Now's the time I want to quickly go over the American cut which has some interesting aspects about it. After the movie played in Japan, it surely had a few theatrical releases outside of its home country. However, when it came to America as late as 1964, the movie went straight to television. Distributed by Four Star International, with an English dub provided by Titra Sound Studios. The American cut isn't anything too special, 
but there are some things to note here. For one, this version reveals the Pyrans right from the opening sequence, whereas the Japanese version holds them off till around the 16 minute mark, and they're not even clearly shown till around 27 minutes in. The movie in the West was being marketed towards kids at the time, so getting the Pyrans on screen as early as possible was a change made so that people themselves don't change the channel. Keep in mind this was a TV movie in the US. The Pyrans also speak in English here. I failed to mention earlier that in the original Japanese version, the Pyrans have their own language, which is accompanied with subtitles. The subtitles are burned in the footage so they couldn't be removed, at least in the print that was used for the international version. This presented a problem since the text would be confusing to a non-Japanese audience, especially since the aliens are now speaking in English. They couldn't strip these scenes out of the movie since the Pyrans have barely any scenes to begin with, so it was decided to crop the subtitles out. And what we're left with here is extreme close-up shots of the Pyrans, even giving a moment where we get this odd panning since the subtitles were going to appear into frame. Another interesting thing is that the American version actually plays out longer than the original. The odd thing is, is that this does cut some things out from the Japanese version. So how is this possible? Well, there are some added newspaper headlines in this version, and there are some scenes that do get reused, the most well-known one being Ginko's transformation back into a Pyran which is just the scene from earlier, but played in reverse. Finally, the title was changed to Warning From Space, which is the title I used for this video because I think it's the overall better name. Space Men Appear in Tokyo really doesn't convey what I'm about to watch better than Warning From Space does, because essentially that's the plot of the movie. And before someone writes it to me, I am aware that this picture did have another US title, going by Unknown Satellite Over Tokyo, which apparently was the original title in America, before it got changed to Warning From Space. I hate the satellite title, and I'm glad it's never used. The American cut does alter some things, but by the end of the day, it's still the same movie. Overall, Spacemen Appear in Tokyo is a very interesting piece of Japanese sci-fi history that unfortunately gets put down due to its shoddy advertisement and lackluster alien suits. But on the plus side, many films that came after it owe themselves to what Spacemen Appear in Tokyo laid out. Toa produced Gorath in 1962, which has a similar premise to Spacemen, with a giant star on its way to impact with Earth, similar to Planet R's role in the movie. Aliens taking the appearance of a famous woman, warning the Earth's inhabitants about a potential threat, would be used in Ghidorah in 1964 with the character Princess Salno. And it couldn't be a coincidence that Toho made their own alien sci-fi film the year prior to this one. There's also this rumor that famed director Stanley Kubrick at some point saw this movie and was inspired by it to do 2001 A Space Odyssey. Like the Godzilla rumor before it, there's nothing on record that proves that, but it would be pretty cool if that be the case. Studio Daiei, of course, would play around with some more effects-heavy pictures with the Gamera and Daimajin series later on. Speaking of which, tell me if this sound effect sounds familiar. Yep, that's the sound effect Gamera would receive when he's flying. The Pirates aren't completely forgotten either, as an enormous one appears in a Gamera manga to help escort him through space and a Pyron appears in the Daikon 4 opening animation, which you should definitely check out if you love kaiju. You're going to see a lot of familiar faces in that. And finally, there exists a Pyron sculpture made by Okamoto himself that can be seen in the Taro Okamoto Museum of Art. Spaceman Appear in Tokyo is not a perfect film by any means, and yeah, it's especially nothing special nowadays, but it is an interesting piece of Japanese cinema history, and I think any tokusatsu enthusiast should check it out at least once. And it shouldn't be hard to view as the film is in the public domain. At least I think it still is. I mean, there's a lot of uploads of the movie on YouTube, and no distributor seems to care about that, so why not? Take an hour and a half of your time and go enjoy Warning From Space. Thank you for watching towards the end here, and I'll see you next time. ウス味とビーフ味カルビーカルコン新発売